Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Making Lighting Design Education Work Across Disciplines, presented by Wes Richter. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit your questions to the presenter and he'll try to answer as many as possible at the end. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after the presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our learning session workshop series on pro.harman.com. We are adding new sessions weekly, so watch for those on the calendar. And now I would like to introduce you to Wes Richter, the presenter for today's webinar. Wes is a New York City-based lighting designer and programmer. His work includes Google and Apple. Christmas party, activations, and kind of others. The opening night of Playboy worked in the Met Museum, Natural History Museum, USS Intrepid, and many others. And now I'll pass it to you, Wes. Hi, everybody. So uh, like Laura said, my event is titled Theater to Events, Making Lighting Design Education Work Across Disciplines. Uh, so this, rather than focusing on the networking and, and real career transition aspects, is actually talking about the ways in which you've already been trained as theatrical lighting designers maybe, or, or other design disciplines from like a traditional college program, how to actually make those skills work in the event world. And you'll actually see that a lot of those skills really translate pretty well in the world of events. So this is gonna be broken into three sections. Uh, and the first of which is the hierarchy of an event design team. Uh, I always consider that the most important part of any professional relationship, figuring out where you fit in. And in anything collaborative like theater or events, that's obviously even more true. So that's gonna mean finding who your director is, who, who your set designer, who your master electrician is on any given high-end wedding, corporate conference, et cetera. And then how talking to these people can be similar to talking to their theatrical counterparts, but more importantly, how it can differ, how that hierarchy itself can differ, and then how the communication itself is a little different. The, the next topic is gonna be the language of design, and that's kind of specifically translating the traditional academic design terminology to event shorthand. So things like, composition, plot, those elements of lighting design, how do those fit into an event workflow? And then I'll talk a little bit on how the technology differs between theater and events, not too in depth, just kind of the differences in gear and how that informs your choices. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about what I call the day of pre-production and the production itself. Uh, in theater, you have an extensive, maybe even lengthy pre-production process. In events, that typically happens in a few hours. So I'll touch on how you might go about compressing that pre-production so that you're ready to do that on site. And then finally, I'll just touch on the standard workflow on an event setup day and how it might differ from a uh, traditional theater tech process. So moving into part one, the hierarchy. Uh, we'll talk about theater a little bit. Uh, in theater, you have mostly clearly defined roles uh, for all the people in that hierarchy. You have the producers, obviously, who provide kind of big picture input. They're the ones writing the check based on your proposal or, or just the ones that decided they wanted to put the show on, right? Directors, they give you the broad concept of what they want the play to do or the musical, and then they'll give you individual guidance uh, based off of you know, how, how to rein you in and the other designers to, to make a cohesive product. Obviously, you as a lighting designer, uh, you work with the design team to you know, develop a concept for your show and then the implementation paperwork and obviously you're in the space, calling the focus, queuing, et cetera. Uh, the master electrician, you give them the implementation paperwork and they execute it, right? Um, and then a little note on assistant lighting designers, 
they're typically on a on a production with enough scale. They're the ones actually interfacing with the master electrician to make sure that the physical decisions are done with respect to your design concept. So in events, obviously it works a little different. Um, there are many more lighting designers in the sense that there are many more people in leadership roles that have a say in the big picture concept of the lighting design of the event. Uh, those can be anything from your, your end client to event planners, the salespeople from your company, project managers, et cetera. And I'll talk more about those uh, later. Um, now, you as a programmer though, are still the LD. And I'll talk about what that means in a bit, but essentially you don't have the ultimate creative control, but you still dictate the aesthetic because you're gonna be the one on site that's most familiar with the technical aspects of lighting design. You know, that composition, you know, the, the framework of how you make certain elements a higher focus than others, color theory, et cetera. So you'll still at the very least be connecting those dots that people give you as a big picture into a cohesive product, right? So a note about programming and the reason why I call it a programmer and not an LD is because very few events actually have lighting designers in my experience, in, in the 150 events I do a year, I'd say about one or two of them, I'm the actual lighting designer on record and I'm having, you know, concept meetings and everything and giving out proposals. I'd say I'd work about, on about two or three that have data, dedicated lighting designers, but the rest, I'm the programmer. So I'm the one who's the most traditional kind of LD on site, or at least I have the most expertise in that area. And that's kind of true across the board. Every events programmer I know, or the vast majority of them have some sort of academic training in lighting design. Most of them have four year degrees in theater or a significant amount of theater experience. Um, so that said, uh, I'll touch on the biggest differences between events and theater in terms of big picture concepts uh, that are important to keep in mind. Uh, and the first thing is the, the walk-in look. So typically what you put the most effort into as a theatrical lighting designer is maybe you were you're the climax of the show or you know the, the big tech heavy element or, or whatever it is, you kind of decide that on a show by show basis. In the events world, it is almost always the walk-in look. And it's, it's kind of in the name, but it's the first impression for all the guests, right? They come in, that's what they see. And that's why, as you can see from these two pictures, it's, it's fairly involved. There's a lot of tech and, and clearly a lot of uh, thought that went into that, right? Uh, it's one basic idea. It's meant to be mostly static, maybe with a little bit of movement. It's designed to be something that the guests kind of interact with live and mingle with. So it's not anything that's, that's too flashy, right? And it's also where the photographers get their best shots. So 30 minutes before, an hour before the doors actually open up, the photographers are taking pictures. So all of the leadership is gonna make sure this look is the most important. The other important element is that the proposal of the event and not a script determines the job and all of the elements of the job. So unlike, unlike a theatrical production where you're figuring out your budget and you're prioritizing things, a salesperson from your production company in the events world is negotiating lighting elements based off of the needs of the event. So like if you look at the picture on the left there, so both of these pictures are from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They're both shows that I programmed. Um, so, so the one on the left, you can, you can see there's, there's different elements, right? There's uh, there's this uplighting on the north wall. There's this interesting moving pattern, moving light pattern on the 
uh, Western Wall, there's uplining of the temple. All of those are different line items on a proposal. The salesperson is saying, okay, uplighting on the North Wall, this is how much it costs. And if the uh, event designer or the end client doesn't want that element, they don't buy it. And then that doesn't get lit. Uh, there's a little negotiation in that on site, but for the most part, what's in the proposal is what happens on the day. Uh, again, that differs from theater in the sense that, you know, the decisions that you get to make on site all have to go back to the proposal. You can't necessarily say, well, I have these four movers over here. Let's light this totally different element because your salesperson may not have sold that and doesn't want to give that away for free to this particular client. Um, so this means you have very little big picture creative input. Obviously that all, a lot of these decisions are made for you, um, but you still work pretty creatively to meet and exceed the intent of the proposal. So to give you some examples in the left photo, that, that moving light wash on the west wall. So that on the proposal just says moving lights to hit the west wall behind the vendor temple. So I actually went in that day and I made that look. Like I decided that I wanted the wash units to be in a rainbow. I wanted the, the spot units to be in that dot in a slowly rotating pattern. And then the salesperson and the event planner gave me notes on that. And sometimes that happens, or sometimes they'll come in knowing what they want those movers to do and then you just have to execute that. Um, another example is the picture on the right. And that is, that was sold as a night sky. So the, that, those, those finer dots, that was a, a gobo that got loaded in the shop before I knew anything about the job. And I have to make a night sky. But just like with theater, where the script might say, I, you know, this, this scene needs to be lit in cool colors. You have a lot of interpretation to, to, to play around with that and to make that work. Cause it, it still takes a lot of kind of specific lighting knowledge and color theory and all of that to, to execute that. So, uh, so in, in this example at the, in the great hall of the Met, I, I said, well, why don't we, why don't we take one of the movers and make that a solid blue wash? Cause that kind of helps, the verisimilitude of a night sky, right? So that all being said, let's look at kind of a flow chart for a standard event hierarchy, right? And this isn't all events, but again, the vast majority of the events I do look like this. So starting at the top, there's the end client, uh, you know, the producer, they're the ones cutting the check and they represent whatever corporation or, or family is putting on the event. Underneath them is the event planner, the event designer that, uh, that they hire because they want them to figure out all these other elements and, and they have a bunch of discussions before everybody else is hired and that everybody else is other vendors and that could be anything, catering, photography, uh, uh, floral, whatever, whatever it is that's at the event that's getting a check, those, those are considered the other vendors, right? And then on that same level is the vendor representative from your company, which is almost always the salesperson, right? And again, they're the ones negotiating the proposal and, uh, and what have you. Um, so underneath that is the project manager. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit what, about what I mean by this, but they're the closest thing to a master electrician. Uh, they're the physical implementers, but they're also the designer of the fixture layout. Um, and then on that same level is the lighting programmer, which is you, right? And, and you're on that same level because once everything's physically implemented, you're the one talking with the salesperson or the event planner for the actual programming of the walk-in look or any cues or effects that, that you're going to be doing. And then under the project managers of the, the actual stagehand crew, as well as you. Um, 
And I say you're part of that as well because the project manager for the physical setup part is deciding your workflow uh, in a lot of ways and is deciding your call time and has a lot of veto power over the choices that you make. So more specifically, the, the end client, right? They're the ones cutting the check. Uh, that they're, they're most closely, their most, uh, I guess, app counterpart is the producer of a theater production, right? They're often a representative of the corporation throwing an event, uh, the mo mother of the bride, uh, the mother of the, the bar mitzvah boy, wh whatever it is, they're the ones who want to throw the party. Um, typically, you won't work with them directly, uh, but sometimes you do, and that could be for multiple reasons, such as the, the uh, event itself, uh, you know, doesn't actually hire an event planner and they're talking with you, or maybe they just want to get more involved. Um, but the things to remember with them uh, are, are that the lighting is a very small part of their day. Unlike a producer for a theatrical production, especially if this end client is the mother of the bride, uh, they have a lot of other things on their plate. Like they have, they have their family drama, maybe uh, if it's a corporation, you know, they're thinking about how this event is going to affect their shareholders, uh, how it works into, you know, their, their schedule for the week, uh, whatever. Um, so the, that's all to say, if, you're, if you happen to be dealing with them directly, try not to give them too many options, right? Just like you may with a producer, you show them what you think the look is going to be. And then if they say, I don't like it, you don't say, well, what exactly would you like me to change about it? You say, uh, okay, here's another option. And you prepare a bunch of other options. And if they don't like that, you say, okay, give me five minutes to work something else up. Um, so that's the end client. Next is the event planner. And that's the one that hires your company. And their, uh, their closest counterpart is the director of a theater show, right? They're often the owner or representative of an event design company, uh, event planning, uh, et cetera. Uh, you'll most likely have direct conversations with them. Uh, and, and the biggest interaction you'll have is a dedicated light check where they're gonna dial in the walk-in look with you, uh, usually with the salesperson present. And essentially that just means they're gonna say, I want this area to be brighter. I want the whole room to be darker, brighter, wh whatever it is, cooler, warmer. They're the ones giving you those notes, much like a director would. So the things to remember with them is that uh, they actually have a fair amount of lighting knowledge and, and it's a little surprising sometimes and refreshing that they might say, oh, uh, so I see you have Sharpies over there. Can they do this? Uh, so, so you kind of have to design based on that or you, you make choices based on, on that framework, much like you would with a director. They're gonna have some technical knowledge as well. Uh, they, the, the event planner also has final veto power over any elements of the lighting of the, the event, much like a, a theater director does. Uh, and oftentimes when the event actually starts, they're the only one that's in charge of you on site. So they'll be giving you notes to change certain things based off of guest feedback or things they haven't noticed until the doors open, et cetera. Uh, next is other vendors, and that's uh, florists, caterers, photographers. They're basically the set designers, the costume designers, et cetera. Uh, they're also hired by the event designer, and all of them will have their own specific needs from lighting, and many of them are above lighting on the totem pole, right? And that kind of works in tandem with with how a, a theater production is done, right? Like a set designer has specific needs and is going to want you to light their set maybe above other aspects of the production. And it's all about the, the compromises you make 
in terms of time, in terms of resources, it's, it's very similar to it, it, in the world of events. Um, the things to remember with them. So you apply their notes as best you can without compromising too much of the actual lighting impact of the show, just like you would on a theatrical production. The only difference is, is that these people aren't really trained necessarily in like in, in creative design in as much of a formal way as you are. So if they ask for something to be done, like they want, they want the, the open bar to be lit up like the sun, you just have to talk with them and explain to them at a more basic level why that's going to mess up the look. Um, so next on the list is the salesperson who is the representative of your company. And, and again, they're the closest thing to the lighting designer in that they're developing the proposal. There are, there are certain big picture elements that will remain constant from the second the salesperson is negotiating it with the client until the end of the event. Um, sometimes they're the ones that request you as the programmer. If, if they know a particular event needs a cued out structure or, or a particularly engaging uh, dance floor light show, they may call you because they know that you can do that. Um, again, often they're the ones making the proposal and, and the majority of the lighting design. So the thing to remember with them is that sometimes they'll have all of the all of the aesthetic already worked out with the client. They may have even picked out colors and gobos from a portfolio of past events. Sometimes the salesperson will just say, okay, we have up lighting and we have a texture wash. So make that happen with the gear you have on site. Um, it, it all depends. It depends on the salesperson and it depends on really the scale of the event. So next on the list is the project manager. And again, they're the closest thing to a master electrician. They're often the one that requests you for a job because ultimately as a programmer, you're, you're hired in, in large respects for your ability to work quickly and help with the logistical install of the show. So they're the ones who are saying, hey, this is the person that can do that quickly and make it look good. Uh, they are often your direct boss. As I said, they'll, they'll decide your call time uh, based off of the budget and negotiations with the salesperson. Uh, and they dictate a lot of your workflow in terms of setup duties. Uh, they're often the one drafting the job and deciding your fixture layout in concert with the lighting proposal. If the lighting proposal says texture wash of this area, they're the ones picking out the fixtures and laying them out. And the thing to remember with that is that their priority is to the logistical efficiency of the, do of the job and reducing uh, the pain and the troubleshooting time. So all of that is to say, if, if photometrically you have to use eight movers to do a particular texture wash of an area, but only six fit on one Saco line, they're gonna pick the six fixture option more than they're gonna wanna spend the extra 20 to 30 minutes on the setup day running another circuit. So that's just something to keep in mind is that a lot of the actual fixture choice decisions are based on efficiency and speed. Um, these guys are also the most overworked person on site uh, the vast majority of the time. So your job is to make their job easier, not hard. So in the theater world, it, that, that obviously should be true too, right? But, but you're able to pretty much just give a work note to your master electrician and given uh, sufficient time and budget, that note will get done. It's up to them to tell you if it's too hard to do in X period of time in the event world, the project manager will make that determination and say yes or no. So 
Lastly, but maybe the most important uh, member of this whole hierarchy is the crew. They're a little different from stage electricians in that they're a lot more likely to be professionals and they're not motivated by moving up in theater or creating high concept art, but by making a paycheck. And this isn't meant to be a bad thing. The, the event schedule is, is, is very packed and everybody in this process, especially the crew and the project manager, they, they likely have a job uh, the very next day. So, so their, their priority as it should be in a theatrical production is to not burn themselves out or go crazy in the process. Um, and, and, and just a note on that, I actually think that this is one of the most valuable parts of, of having experience in the event world is that, is that keeping this kind of stuff in mind makes you better at prioritizing your time and prioritizing labor as a, as a finite resource and as a human element uh, in the theater world. Um, one last note on them, uh, they're not necessarily trained in electrics work. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is they're, they're often asked to do many more jobs than just put up the lighting rig. So you have to be a little more selective than you may be on a, on a, on a theatrical production setup in terms of picking your crew based on the job you want them to do, like troubleshooting a moving light. There's going to be probably less people uh, on your electric crew on an event that, that know how to do that. Um, uh, troubleshooting DMX problems, et cetera. Right. So, that all kind of concluded the hierarchy portion. That's definitely the longest portion because I, I always feel that's the most important in terms of dictating your collaborative language and your, your creative workflow. Um, but moving on, uh, part two is the uh, is a language of design, which in theater, we, we focus even subconsciously on the academic functions of, of lighting, which is basically, if you remember the Lighting Design 101 textbook, it talks about the different components and the functions of a lighting design. And I'll go in more of these later, but I'm talking about things like visibility, uh, revelation of form, projection, location, effect, uh, all of that. Uh, when you're communicating with a design team, all of those functions that I just mentioned inform your conversation with them because they're all academically trained. A lot of them went to the same classes as you. Uh, and, and even in the, the professional world, a lot of them took the same script analysis classes uh, at different schools. Uh, so all of those functions of light really inform your conversation. So if you're talking to a set designer and you say, well, you know, I could make your set the focus of this show, but I think in this moment of the script, it's compositionally better to have uh, this one person down left lit in a spot and to have the set door, right? That's just one example. Um, so the right answer uh, in terms of your communication and, and, and how you communicate is what you can justify, right? what makes sense with the script, uh, what, what looks good on stage, what reads, etc. So in the event design world, uh, the language of design is still in use, just a little uh, more, uh, a little less formal. So the academic functions of lighting, in abstract, again, this is lighting light items on proposals, right, rather than the script. So while you're not using for uh, vocabulary like composition and focus, uh, your communication is still based on achieving those effects or, or achieving those those line items as objectives, uh, and then and then making it a cohesive project or product. Uh, communicating with that design team, the the intent of the event designer and the other vendors much, must be considered much in the same way as a theatrical lighting or, or, or a theatrical 
design in general, right? The, the intent of the event planner as a concept, all of that, that needs to inform all of your communication. So rather than you as an independent element that's saying, well, this, this is what I, I, I think works with the lighting concept, you're more, your, your communication has to be based on everything you do supporting the, the proposal and the intent of the event designer and the other vendors. So to sum up the right answer in that situation is anything that's on brand with the event. Um, the, the nature of the event, the nature of the proposal, anything that any of the choices you make, they have to follow that, which is kind of similar to things following the script uh, in a theatrical production. So in theater lighting, we, we kind of know how to build a look with the elements, right? So I have an image from one of my productions just to take a look at. So take a sec to look at this and, and, and analyze it in terms of composition, form, plot, and all of that. So you can see that those elements present in this image. And if you know the show is Metamorphoses, you may even know which part of the script this is. This is the final act, uh, I believe with Zeus and Hera uh, uh, at their house. So you know that the, the focus obviously is on the main characters and all of the, the actors in the front and the actual pool. Uh, they're, they're side lit, they don't need to be visible. They're dimmer than the, the, the main characters and the upright, uh, all of the things, composition form, uh, even projection with the gobo, that's, that's all present in this image and we know how to analyze it because we're, we're trained in that, right? So in event lighting, the, the elements are designed to bring art to an events world. Right, it's, it's taking what are just line items on a proposal and making art out of it. So this image, uh, this still is a very aesthetically pleasing, uh, but, but you can kind of analyze it and say, well, okay, I understand how this is lighting things on a proposal. And you can actually see how now that I've told you it's a bar mitzvah, you can understand why, why certain choices were made. So you see this, uh, this banner in the back here. Uh, yeah, this. So this is the bar mitzvah boy's name. And it's obviously like uh, something that really needs to have a lot of focus because uh, he's the, the guest star. Um, there's there's these mirror balls that you can kind of see that was obviously very important to the decor team and the event planner. Uh, there's these little floral arrangements that are highlighted a little bit, but you could see that choices I made on the day for the walk and look informed by, you know, notes from the project manager and the uh, salesperson event planner, uh, they all made this image still use those elements, right? Uh, you see the, the gobo projection on the ground. The, you see that the mood of the event is informed in part by the fact that uh, it's a bar mitzvah. It's, it's you know, it's, it's somebody becoming a man. So it's, it's a little more masculine colors. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's basically, you're still using all those elements. It's just to a different end, right? So how does the language actually differ? Uh, the, the main thing I would say is that rather than considering each of the elements as, as separate things that, that you analyze academically, you think of them as parts of the broader goal of the event. Uh, and that's not only just lighting the proposal, but making it an enjoyable thing for the guests. So I'll actually go through all the functions of lighting design and I'll give you an example of how you may think about those in terms of an event specific uh, workflow. So selective visibility, right? That's 
that's basically saying, well, so my, my guests want to be able to see, but they don't want to be lit directly because when you go to a party, you don't want to be lit up like the sun. So as you're laying out your movers and your focus and all of that on the day, you basically keep that in mind and you say, well, you know, maybe I will light them indirectly or I won't light them from too shallow of an angle or whatever. But most of the time you're, you're not trying to directly light the guests to make them visible. You want to make them be able to see things. Um, revelation of form. How do you make vendor elements pop, right? Do you, do you dedicate movers that the project manager originally meant for something else so that you can, uh, you can light the banner from a high side angle and then you use other movers to accomplish the original goal of those, right? You, you're still using your, your kind of your angle study on the event day. Uh, focus, what needs extra lighting, right? That banner in the back of that bar mitzvah image, that needs some extra lighting, right? The, the, the floral elements and, you know, how do you compose your total image to, to integrate those? Location, where is the event, right? Is it in an abandoned warehouse or is it in an elegant hotel ballroom? That is going to give you a, a, obviously a, a, a fair amount of influence on the nature of the event itself, but then what the walk-in look should look like, right? Because if it's a place with a lot of exposed I-beams, you're probably going to try to light those. Mood. What is the guest list like? Is it all people over 60 attending a luncheon for uh, a nonprofit? Or is it a bunch of 20 somethings that work for Etsy or Google that want to have a rave, right? That, that's going to dictate where your walk-in look is quite a bit. Projection, how should the texture look? Again, if, if it's a more abstract event, if it's a younger audience, then your texture is going to be sharper or geometric. Uh, the, whatever texture you pick out of the moving light that you have, you're, you're picking the one that makes the most sense for the event because maybe it's an elegant wedding and maybe you're just doing the dappled pattern that's out of focus. Plot, what's on brand? If it's an event for Acer, you're probably gonna light something up green. If it's an event for Chase, you're probably gonna light something up blue. If it's a wedding where the bride really likes pink and all the flowers are pink, well, you're probably gonna have some pink, right? Composition, that's, that's really your, your most valuable uh, asset as a lighting designer coming into the world of events. How do you balance all the different vendor needs, all of the different elements on the proposal? How do you balance those intensities to make those things pop, but still work as a cohesive image in a still shot of your walk and look, right? And then finally, effect. How crazy should the light show be? A lot of events have da dance floors that you're going to be busking. And a lot of events use the same top 40 songs. But what dictates how crazy your show is going to be is maybe a little bit from your event planner and a little bit just your own judgment based off of the nature of the guests, right? You know, get lucky by Daft Punk or any of those, you know, kind of mainstay songs, you could have a crazy buildup with strobes or it could just be slow movement with a sign dimmer chase. And, and that's a decision you're making just like you would in a theatrical production, you're making a decision on the, the nature of the effect based on the script. So that kind of concludes that. And, and none of those are hard and fast rules, but it's, it's basically just to show you that all of those terms have a place in your standard event setup. So what does this mean as an events plan or events program? Um, so the broad strokes are given to you by the event designers. If there's no clear direction on color or texture, as I said, happens sometimes, uh, 
you use your training to make those choices and you have to be prepared to back up why you made those choices or you have to be ready to change those. Because again, they have the final say on everything. Um, the details though, of course, are all you. You connect the dots, as I've said, you make it a cohesive project. So you may get broad stroke, uh, you know, uh, input on color, mood, texture, all of that. But, but you're the one who's using your color theory knowledge to say, well, maybe the blue they want should be a little more sky blue because they want the texture wash to be orange or maybe not, right? That's, that's where you really use your training on almost every single event. So again, if, uh, if I hadn't mentioned it already, all of this is done live. You're making the choices as the programmer uh, on the day, on the spot. All of your focus changes and color, select, color selection are going to be done almost simultaneously. So we'll move on to the differences in gear. Uh, and I won't touch on this too long, uh, but in the theater world, you can use more static fixtures because you have more setup time, right? So that's not to say, obviously, there are Broadway productions with all mover rigs, but if I'm putting together the budget for a lighting design, um, I know that I have time with work and focus notes, and I have a static focus period that I will prioritize getting more lights from more angles for the same amount of money that it would take me to buy movers. But in the events world, it's almost always going to be movers unless it's a particularly low budget production because that you have less setup time. And, and because quite frankly, they want you as the programmer to make a lot of the choices that a moving light can give you. Again, most of those choices are made by you, the programmer. Uh, they're, they're often only limited by the position of your actual movers, because as you know, moving lights can, can be highly customizable in position, zoom, gobo, uh, whatever. Um, so uh, a lot of those examples, moving spots, moving washes, right? Uh, a little note on the rest of the gear, you're gonna see fixtures that are more effect oriented that you just wouldn't use in theater, right? There's gonna be a lot more beam fixtures uh, in the event world because you're doing dance floor stuff, then you may necessarily see that in the theater world. So just familiarizing yourself with that equipment and the functionality of it is very important. Uh, lastly, up lighting. I, I think there may be, I, I can count on two hands how many events I've done in the last several years that haven't had up lighting. They're very easy to lay out. They're very easy to customize. They're very easy to program. Uh, and and that's, that's basically the workhorse of the event industry in terms of creating interesting walk-in looks. You can kind of see that uh, in the image on the, uh, on the right here. That is very much, um, uh, you know, a lot of that is being influenced by a two-tone uplight, uplighting system. This is obviously uh, the lobby of uh, David Geffen Hall at Lincoln Center. You can kind of see there was a mover texture wash of the ceiling. So that kind of concludes part two, the language of design and the gear. Again, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask them at the, at the end of this. Um, so part three, uh, again, is the pre-production process, which in the theater world, that means full paperwork, including plot and instrument schedule. And obviously there are productions you do where the rig is small enough to where you can kind of keep the plot in your head, but you're still designing and you're still thinking about how you're gonna use that plot and you're still thinking about the instrument schedule before you go into the space. You usually know what you're walking into. 
Uh, in theory, you have production meetings, at least one, but usually more, uh, to iron out potential issues, work out schedule, uh, whatever. It's all it, it's all designed to make the the actual tech process as smooth as possible. In the event world, paperwork is sometimes provided in the sense you may get a plot from your project manager, you may not, but essentially the pre-production that you're going to do is your show file in your lighting console. That's, that's where you can do a lion's share of the, the, the quote unquote busy work of programming up front, right? And, and that's certainly been talked about at length, I know in other, uh, other of these Martin webinars, um, but I, I do wanna say that is your most valuable asset and that is almost always your only pre-production. Uh, meetings, maybe you'll get an email about what the job is, uh, but you probably won't. All of the meetings are, are quick on-site conversations. Again, it's all live. You must come in with a workflow that's highly adaptable because you're not going to be able to figure out these things in advance like you would on a theater production. But you still have to be able to access a lot of your kind of theater design uh, instincts just quicker, right? So the average day at an event your duties, uh, they're gonna start out being, being the physical duties of the, the event setup. And I, I, do, I do wanna talk about this image. This is uh, at the American Museum of Natural History. And obviously that is the lobby of the museum. And the, the thing about that is that that closes at 5.30 PM every day even days of the event, unless somebody has really deep pockets and they want to rent the whole museum out, uh, which means that goes down at 5.30. And if they want the event to start at seven, the event is starting at seven. And somebody is designing a fixture layout based off of being able to put it together in 90 minutes. So you have to program it in about 30, right? Maybe less. So during the setup process, uh, you're gonna give some guidance on positions if you're there early enough. You may be able to say, well, okay, this tower actually needs to move five feet this way, otherwise the moving lights on it will be useless. So you kind of have to keep your head on a swivel to think about how you're gonna program the walk-in look when it's all up and running. Uh, static focus, every now and then you'll be, uh, you'll be asked to run just a regular static Lico focus. Now, that could be anything from just focusing a step and repeat. Maybe that will be the texture wash for an area if they, if they didn't really want to deal with running uh, DMX, um, what have you. Um, patching, that's, that's a big one. That's, that's a lot of the times the first thing you're going to be doing on site. You will get the plot or you will just have to look and see what's in the air and and you'll, you'll have to quickly be able to give your crew addresses and patch them in the console so that you can flash out the rig, right? Sometimes it's done for you, but you know most of the time it, it won't be. Uh, you'll be assisting troubleshooting, right? Obviously in the theater world, the, the board op is, is sitting there bringing up channels to make sure they work but a lot of the times you're the most knowledgeable person in terms of troubleshooting signal flow issues. Um, so, so that is typically I've been relied upon a lot to iron out troubleshooting issues. E either that, or I just know that I can do it very quickly so that the rig is up and running and I can start programming. The actual programming, you're gonna be programming the walk-in look as we've talked about, and you're programming any cues or any uh, pop-up performances. I had an image a few slides back of an aerialist in a moon, uh, you know, that kind of stuff that's, that's, that's just sort of pop-up or in the middle of the event. There's gonna be less time devoted to you to be able to program that, but you'll still have to create distinct looks based off of lining a performance like you would in theater. Um, 
So for actual showtime, you're going to be executing any of those cues, but also I, I don't put it here, but you're also babysitting the walk-in look and adjusting the walk-in look intensity based on kind of reading the room and on any kind of changes in daylight, if you're facing windows or you're outside in a tent. Um, also busking any dance floor or performance, you typically aren't going to have one single cue stack for performances because that's not that won't be good for your workflow. Uh, but so you, you really have to polish up your busking, uh, you know, to be a, a marketable events program. Um, the paperwork, it's now your show file, right? And again, I don't want to talk too much about this. Uh, this is one of Christian Jackson's uh, show file layouts. I, I recommend uh, looking at his, if you want to look at uh, uh, Grand MA, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of resources for augmented, et cetera. Uh, but I don't want to talk about that too much other than to say the flex, the more flexible and the more interchangeable your show file is, the better, because most of the time you don't know what the rig is uh, until the day of. Here are some examples. I'm not going to go through these. Um, these are just things that I or others have found particularly valuable uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, you know making making quick decisions and and really removing the busy work that you don't need to do every single time you boot up a console. Um, yeah, layout view, clone fixtures, dynamic effects, fixture personalities, personalized views, uh, but not limited to that, right? It's whatever makes it easy for you. Focus. Um, so that whole process, focus, queuing, that's now you at a console or a tablet, and it's all done on the day. So learning to program moving lights is essential. Understanding what they can do and then understanding what they can't do in terms of breaking the laws of physics, right? But all of those attributes I listed, position, color, image, zoom, gobo, you need, you need, to, be access, you need to access those individually, but you need to understand their function as part of the whole look. So anything you can do now to look at things in 3D visualization or uh, you know anything you could do at school to play with movers, that's so, so important for, for translating into other industries. Um, because again, most of it will be decided by you on the day, right? Um, and then a note on that is going back to what moving lights can't do, you need to know that when you zoom a moving light out all the way and put in a saturated color, you may not be able to actually see the beam with all the other competition. So it's, it's best to kind of know that going into the process. Again, it's just something that comes with experience with playing with moving lights. Um, <laughs> your pre-production is just knowing how to do it fast. I keep driving this home, but it's very important. The speed is the most vital part of this process. So production meetings, those are set up day conversations. Uh, this, this was uh, Etsy's Halloween party. And, and these are all conversations that are happening an hour of four doors with a loud sound check going on in a dark room. Um, prioritizing the information is essential. You figure out the most important information that you can get out of whoever you're talking to in five minutes. That's your objective. Because you're going to fill in the blanks with whatever you can't find out with your own experience, and you're just going to put something up. And then you just address whatever issues somebody might have, might have, uh, when they come up. Because maybe you'll just throw up a look that you're not sure that the event planner will like, and they go, I love it. And then you didn't have to waste the those two or three minutes having that conversation. So to wrap it up, uh, the, the bottom line of this is to be fast, but rely on your education. You are hired because of your design acumen. 
the basics are still the basics. Just like in theater, you don't want to be, you don't want to try to be too academic because you can lose sight of the whole to start working on the parts, right? And, and in events, it's especially important to, to focus on, you know, will the guests see this thing? Will they, will they even appreciate it? Is it worth spending time on this, right? Because that goes into prioritizing your time, right? You may have to sacrifice your, uh, your kind of bougie design brain in order to get the event up and running and not like, not make everybody's day miserable, right? Uh, but still focus on making good art. Everybody loves good art, right? It's, if, if you have the time to try something interesting, then, I'm not, sorry, uh, then, then you should do that because ultimately that's what sets you apart from other programmers and allows you to move up. Um, almost everything is more important than lighting, but lighting is still the most important. You, you are going to notice things that are going to end up being fatal problems when the event actually starts, such as a giant light up display in the center of the dance floor, right? You know that that's gonna put a damper on the mood and make people not wanna dance. They're not gonna, nobody in the leadership's gonna know that up front. You have to communicate that because you know that you're going to get a note on that during the production when there's nothing you can do. So you're communicating based off of making your element more important to other designers. So that, that kind of wraps up my, my presentation. Uh, we'll, I'll kick it over to, to Laura and Brad soon uh, for, the, uh, for the questions. I'm just gonna throw up my, uh, my contact info real quick. Um, feel free to contact me whenever, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to answer anything. You're, you're getting me at a good time and I'm a little less busy than I normally would be this time of year. Um, but you know, please check out my website too. You can also visit me at the Sovereign Candle Collective office. That's uh, actually where I'm at right now. And that's, uh, that's the name, uh, myself, Luther Frank, Brandon Gauthier and Ken Sprague have given to a little lighting collective uh, that we formed to kind of share ideas and to share workload. Um, but all of us would love to talk lighting with you. And if you're in the city uh, and you come with a mask, we'll, uh, we'll give you free coffee. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, so, so feel free to contact me directly and I'll shoot the address over to you if you want to visit. Um, but yeah, that said, I'll kick it over to, uh, I guess, Brad for the questions. Yeah, hi Wes, that was an excellent presentation. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks. Uh, we, we do have some questions that have come in. Uh, sure. The first one is, how does one start out to get opportunities for lighting events? Do you start with a lighting company or an events company or some other way? So I started with a lighting company. I, I walked in already knowing how to program the Grand MA. Um, that, that tends to be the console most in use uh, in the events world in New York City. Uh, but, but essentially, I, I started out, and, and most of the people I know started out slinging a wrench in an events company that tends to have a high turnover rate with programmers because the programmers end up moving up to doing other things. Unlike theater where they say, oh, just start slinging a wrench and maybe a designer will love how you focus the light. Um, I mean, that does happen, but in the event world, it, it, you know, especially where I started out, uh, that, that, was, that was almost a, a guarantee to move up as long as you don't like, as long as you don't piss anybody off and as long as you know the console. Bottom line, learn how to program multiple consoles, start with the MA, but learn everything you can. And, and how did you make the transition to the event world yourself? What held you back and what helped you progress? So actually Luther Frank, who's on this call and who did other, uh, other webinars uh, for Martin, um, some very good ones you should check out. Uh, 
he actually he actually sang the praises of the event world to me before I even moved up to New York. I had almost exclusively just done theater, uh, and and yeah, I I moved up with the intention of starting in events and maybe doing some theater work on the side. Uh, the the same way like I talked about with the first question, just starting slinging a wrench, knowing the console, and you know eventually my my sort of design brain got used more and more in the events world yeah great now you uh, you mentioned about the consoles and you mentioned the ma is it in that being the mostly used at least in your area are there other consoles that you see and do you ever get to choose what desk you want um there are there are certainly uh the 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 odd shows where I get to choose the lighting console. If I'm the LD of an event or I'm putting together an, a proposal, I can. Um, I do see hogs a lot and, and I do wish I knew the hog more because I'd be working more. Um, I, I, think, I think generally you wanna learn everything you can. I'd say in the events world, it goes pretty much brand MA, hog, ETC, but, but learn, learn all that you can, especially if you came in with ETC knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Next question is, are most events basically a single look or are there multiple cue opportunities throughout the event other than of course, dance floors? So that really, that really depends. Um, it, it depends on the scale of the event and it depends on, uh, it depends on, uh, your rig and the budget and all of that. Uh, you can, uh, you can have a wedding where you have a separate queue because you have the resources for it for the first dance, right? Um, if you're doing a corporate conference, your queue might just be to darken the room and bring the podium light up. All the way to, uh, you know, I did, I did a private concert with Flo Rida. That was actually the after party for a very big wedding. So there was actually a, a busking slash queued sequence when he showed up. So it's basically anywhere from nothing, you program the walk and look and then you sit there the rest of the night to you're hunched over the desk the whole night. Yeah. Cool. All right, next question. With the more recent integration of video and lighting coming together, especially in live concert entertainment, do you foresee these elements moving into the events industry? And how can we make this a faster process? Well, I would say, I would say they, they already have quite a bit, um, not necessarily, you know, the, the, the really high concept video stuff, but I, a lot of events I do have video walls and, and video operators, you know, either VJing along with my busking or, you know, as iMag, which is just like the image that a camera sees behind the presenter. Um, occasionally I see projection mapping. Uh, I, I see projection mapping actually at the Met all the time where they do 3D mapping of the temple or uh, the, the, the American wing. Uh, the, those elements are already there and they're moving in uh, progressively more as time goes on. Cool. All right, what are the main differences you see between lighting professionals who have a theater background and those who don't? Are there large advantages in either direction when working in an events context? That's a that's an interesting question. So, um, I would say I would say that that the there are obviously a, a as I said, most of the events programmers I know started in theater. They have a theater background, you know, at varying levels of you know, that being professional or educational. Um, so, so that's, I, I guess I've noticed that those people tend to be able to be relied upon for the more creative aspects of it. Uh, and, and ultimately, so ultimately their, their biggest weakness though, theater professionals is that they tend to have a deficit in terms of speed uh, just just starting out because they they you know they're used to working on a two week time frame they're used to having teams of people uh, you know to kind of rely on as support staff um, 
So I noticed that starting out, and that's actually the biggest thing that causes programmers to wash out early is just not being able to handle the pace. But at the same time, the reason I see more theater professionals transition to event programming than say rock and roll guys is because you can teach speed and you can, you can uh, analyze people for speed and, and, and evaluate based on that, but you can't, you can't teach creativity, right? That's an innate thing. And once you figure out the speed, that's, that's when being a theater professional really makes you shine. I, I, I hope I answered the question. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. All right, a couple more questions. Sure. What tools or devices do you bring with you to an event and what is the very most important one? So I bring, I bring a little router. Uh, I don't, I don't have it with me cause it's, it's been a while since I've, I've really needed it. Uh, yeah, no, I, I bring a, a little router about this big. It was about 80 bucks uh, because that's all I need with a grand MA, uh, you know, console to to make my phone a remote control device, right? Uh, so I, I find that a lot of times companies won't necessarily think to bring the router or you know have inspect that or don't know that the console has that functionality. So the ability to, to step out from the desk and on a phone or a tablet be able to talk with a salesperson or or the client uh, and talk through looks versus having to go back and forth, that's hands down the most valuable thing. Um, and then beyond that, I would say, you know, if you want a DMX cat or, you know, a wrench to be able to jump in if you need to, but, but yeah, that, that router has been the most valuable for sure. Yeah. I can imagine being able to walk around with the, the handheld is very important. Oh yeah. Sure. All right. One more question here. Can you share a story about a time that the language of design did not connect between the various stakeholders of an event? Hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll give the best example because this is something I, I run into a lot and I, I, kind of, I kind of brought this up, but it's, it's something I come in contact with uh, almost every event, which is that Nobody thinks about the fact that the, the dance floor needs to be dark for people to want to dance, right? And that's a function of mood and composition and all of that. I could say to, so for instance, if there's, you know, if there's house lighting that nobody wants to, to take the effort to find the venue person to turn off, or there's a, a big lit up element or a photographer with their own light, uh, whatever. Uh, if, if I'm trying to say, no, the mood of the show will be severely impacted by having this, this light there, that is, that is the time where I, <laughs> it's been in a positive way. The more I interact with those event planners, the more they trust me on that. But when you're first starting out, um, it's very difficult to, to make that kind of change on site, to use that lighting design language to make that change. And, but you know, the good part is, is that you're almost always proven right. Yeah. <laughs> Super, well, we've come to the end of the questions. And again, this was a wonderful session, Wes. We really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for joining us. We have lots more sessions coming up through uh, through the end of the year and into next year. So please join us for more of those. And all sessions, including this one, are recorded and available to find on the Martin website as well. So again, thank you, Wes, and thank you, everyone. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Heather. Thank you.